Hello everyone, my name's Leanne Collingburn. I'm the head of uh, Pro Bono at Hopgood Gannon Lawyers and I'm also a management committee member at Caxton Legal Centre. Welcome everyone to our 2022 Justice in Focus Water Story Series, uh, which is co-hosted by Hopgood Gannon Lawyers and Caxton Legal Centre and in recognition of Australian Water Association's National Water Week. I'll shortly introduce you to our guests that we have with us today. But before I do, I want to acknowledge that I'm on Turrbal and Yagara land here in Mianjin, Brisbane. I want to pay my respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to any First Nations people who are listening to this recording. In acknowledging country, I would also like to acknowledge the image and the painting behind me, which is by Yagal artist Francis Bell Parker. The painting was commissioned by Hopgood Ganham Lawyers as a visual representation of our three pro bono priority areas of working with First Nations communities, mitigating the impact of environmental disasters and reducing domestic and family violence. And we thought it was a really fitting image and backdrop for this series. Our 2022 Justice in Focus Water Stories series shines a light on land and water management disaster planning and responses and human rights. Through a series of pre-recorded interviews and a live lunch and learn with Naomi Moran, General Manager of the Curry Mail, we will explore multidisciplinary responses to environmental disasters and climate change in Australia, particularly the more recent flooding events in Queensland and Northern New South Wales. By sharing the water stories of our guest speakers, we are hoping to better understand our responses and preparedness to environmental disasters, to generate discussion and to encourage human rights centred approaches and responses against all actions relating to land, law and people. And now I'd like to introduce you to our guest. Uh, our guest today is Jo Hedger. Jo leads Deloitte's Indigenous Services Group focused on working with clients and First Nations communities to solve complex problems. He is a proud Bundjalung and Yorta Yorta man and is highly respected for bringing the latest trends in strategy, technology, innovation to empower clients and First Nations communities to be future fit in an increasing complex, disrupted and competitive market. Jo also leads Deloitte's growing work on First Nations procurement, climate and sustainability and is a recognised thought leader in this space. He also contributes to innovation, thought-provoking issues on national and, of national and global importance to inspire new conversations and disruptive thinking. What excites Jo every day is being able to reimagine and reshape a nation that centres First Nations wisdom, creating a clever and enduring legacy of making the world of our clients, our people and our communities better. Welcome, Joe. Thanks, Leanne. Now, to start our, um, our series and our, our Water Stories event, we've asked our guests to choose uh, an image uh, of a water resource that resonates with them or that they're connected to. So, Joe, I'm going to start off by asking you about the image behind you. So it's the Clarence River um, in Grafton and on Bundjalung country. It's a, it, it's a picture I've, I've taken from my most recent time um, up on country. And, and the reason why it, it has, uh, has meaning for me is one, that's a, that that river's a, it's, it's a source of uh, livelihood for our communities. And that river runs all the way through Grafton, all the way to my community, which is Bayou Eagle. And that's where I have my family ties and cultural and community links too. Um, but it's a beautiful river. It's you know it's it's one of the great um, you know river systems across the country. Uh, certainly impacted um, numerous times by flooding. Um, but it's a yeah it's a, it's a river. It's a picture that um, has a lot of meaning for me, as I'm sure it does for a lot of people who, who live in those um, communities surrounded by that river. Thanks, Joe. I'm so glad you you chose that river. Um, that river is is very close and dear to me, having grown up in in Yamba in New South Wales. And um, in Yaga language, it's Barimba, and it's actually Francis 
um, the artist um, for our artwork is actually from that community. So I'm sure she's really glad you've chosen that image as well. So thank you. Um, Joe, to start off, and you've already kind of hinted at it and, and given a little bit of information um, about your connections to community, but to start, the, I guess, the journey of your water story and sharing your water story with us as part of this series, would you first um, share your a little bit more detail about your connection to the Northern Rivers community in New South Wales? Sure. So, as I mentioned, my my family come from a very tiny Aboriginal community called Bayugal and tracing back numerous, numerous generations, um, always had a very proud, strong, ongoing connection to that country. And as I mentioned earlier, rivers, water systems, they're an integral part of our way of life. It's where we hunt, it's where we practice our culture, it's where we tell stories, it's how we maintain a close relationship to our history and our ongoing culture and story. Um, that also comes with, I guess, both a good story, but there's also a, a lot of stories um, that are starting to emerge, particularly around um, just some of the history of massacres that occurred and, and their relationship to those waters and particularly where um, a, a lot of our community members um, you know, was subjected to some horrific acts over history um, in, involving, you know, people drowning in those rivers. And there's a story which I won't reveal and maybe people might want to look into it, but there is a story that gets told about the Clarence River and Grafton and its relationship to a lot of those historical um, incidents. But to to bring it back to a positive story, it's, um, yeah, the, the connection to the community is, um, you know, for me is one of immense pride, um, recognising that the Bunjilung Nation stretches quite large across the whole of the North Coast and the Northern Rivers region. Um, and, and in many ways, we're all connected um, through different relationships. And But it's interesting to look at how those river systems um, connect those communities as well. Mm, yeah, it's that deeper, that deeper connection to the systems. And, um, you know, thank you for sharing that, Joe. So um, you've mentioned the Bundjalung community um, a couple of times, and we know that earlier this year that that community was was quite devastatingly impacted uh, by the floods. And as I mentioned, we've got Naomi Moran, um, an interview with Naomi Moran coming up. Um, but the first flood, I guess, uh, impacted the community on the 28th. Excuse me. The first flood impacted the community on the 28th of February this year, um, and I call it the first flood because very soon after a second flood followed uh, on the 30th of March, so the impact um, was felt for that community around the Northern Rivers um, twice um, and quite devastatingly. Um, and it has been reported as the region's um, worst recorded flood in history, um, the first flood. We first connected on social media um, following your call out, I guess, on that platform um, to, to try to rally up a little bit of support and to, uh, I guess, identify what was, what was going on in those communities to, um, to your networks. And I just wondered if you could um, talk about a little bit a little bit about that, but then secondly, you you actually then went on on country back home um, to help with that immediate recovery. Uh, and I just wondered if you could share a little bit about your experience with that as well. Sure, and it was um, I think it was Naomi's um, post, or it might have been um, some footage from NITV where Naomi was on the um, she was on a boat. Um, just a small, a small dinghy as um, as the flood started to surround uh, Lismore, and just the um, I, I guess just the impact I saw what the floods was having on her at the time, but also just this um, immense determination to want to do something to help community, particularly with the rescue, um, the recovery efforts, and. 
she said something. I think she said something along the lines of, you know, if it happens to one of us, it happens to all of us. And that that really stuck with me. Uh, you know, I was sitting at home in Canberra just watching the um, the flood starting to to hit Lismore, um, you know, in, in a very devastating way. And watching Naomi, um, you know, dealing with the floods, putting a call out, and, and I just felt just felt compelled to, to to find a way to be useful and to help out. And once the once the water started to um, recede, and and I, and I remember just grabbing everything I could and just packing the packing the car, packing a trail, and going up there, not knowing. Um, you know, if you're able to get into the community, not knowing what state the community was going to, going to be in, um, not knowing, you know, where you're going to stay, but just feeling absolutely compelled to be there for community, to be able to help community, um, because it, you know, for many people, we, we, you know, we've we've lived with floods, um, and particularly up in the Northern Rivers region, where floods are not something that are uncommon, but there was just something about this flood that made me. Um, ha have a lot more concern about the community and, um, and and just feeling that sense of, you know, needing to do something, um, which a lot of people did. Certainly it just wasn't me, but there was a lot of people in the community and uh, other parts of the country that just felt the need to go up there and help. Uh, but it was really, it was really Naomi's um, call out on NITV and thinking that, you know, I've got two options, I can sit at home and and watch what goes on or you can actually just jump in a car and get up there and find a way to help yeah yeah and when you and when you got there on on country and on the ground but as long as it's you know you're okay to talk about it um what what did you see and what you know in terms of the community the impact and also the mobilization the one thing you noticed pretty quickly was the, the extraordinary impact this had had on the community. Um, just watching people in this incredibly shocked um, state of mind, it, it was it was like some catastrophic event bomb had just hit Lismore, and and the people were. Um, you know, just facing and dealing with the immediate aftermath of that. I've never seen anything like that before. Um, at the same time, you started to see the emergence of this extraordinary resilience start to take shape and people starting to mobilise, support one another. As I got down to the Koori Mail, there was just this little tent that they had set up just to start managing, um, you know, donations coming in. Nothing, no, nothing of a grand scale, just something really small. Um, and it, it was just, it was incredibly remarkable just to see communities starting to work and what you also noticed was that um, there wasn't much um, or anything that resembled government stepping in at the time and everything was being community led it was being community um, driven so against the backdrop of what was just a unimaginable um, you know, state of events and impacts and aftermath. It was the the thing that really got me was the um, the leadership, the extraordinary effort by community to respond, to stand things up, and to start to mobilise the right type of assistance for those who had lost property, lost life, and don't know what their next day would look like. Mm. And I think um, I think the New South Wales flood inquiry, which was um, released in July this year. Um, actually acknowledge that, acknowledge that community mobilisation and leadership um, and and in futures made recommendations um, for government to support that in some way um, to enable that, that community led decisions um, and um, and responses to, to, you know, really kind of mobilise and um, which is which is wonderful. Something that you also did in terms of, I mean, because you kept, uh, because I was following quite closely um, your updates um, as you're on the ground there in Lismore. And something that um, I think you did also particularly well um, during that time was really um, challenge your audience 
which you know being in a large corporate organization is you, you do have that sphere of influence with with corporates and and others um, to to really challenge them in terms of what it means to support First Nations communities and you know what it means to um, embrace reconciliation and acknowledging country and, and things like that. So could you just tell us a little bit about what you did in that space during that time? I think it's a it, it was a case of getting people to go beyond just very simple, easy to do um, you know statements around reconciliation. And if you look across, Corporate Australia, most organisations have a reconciliation action plan. They commit to, um, you know, doing some good things. And hopefully most of the time they do do that. But it's in situations like this where you really start to see who goes beyond just a, a, a very um, simple statement of acknowledging country of committing to reconciliation and to doing good things for the community to those who actually get involved and those who respond when that support is needed most and and i certainly challenge my own um, organization at deloitte we you know we we weren't immune from that um that accountability because like other big four organizations we have a reconciliation action plan Everyone acknowledges country at events. So the challenge for me was, you know, for, for me to take back to even to my own organisation was, you know, you, you can't acknowledge country and not acknowledge what was happening in Lismore and the surrounding communities that had just been impacted by some of the most devastating natural disaster events ever to occur in this country. And you can't stand behind a reconciliation action plan and not stand behind these communities that need the, that support more than ever. And and it's not to it's not to place criticism on those organisations, but it's to encourage them to stand up and it's encouraging them to find a way to contribute um, for communities that need it the most. Because many of your listeners um, watching this will know that for that region, that northern Rivers region is one of the most disadvantaged parts of the country, not just New South Wales. It has such entrenched disadvantage even before the floods. And what the floods have done is not, not only impacted from a natural disaster perspective, but it's further entrenched and exacerbated a lot of that disadvantage, which, which goes back to my point, which is you know, we, we've got to start thinking very serious now about not only how we deal with the aftermath of that natural disaster, but a lot of the, um, I, I guess, the circumstance that those communities now find themselves in and what can big corporates, what can other organisations do to get behind those communities as they start to rebuild their lives going forward? Yeah, and I think um, I think that's so important to, to really challenge in, in times, well, at all times, to be honest, but particularly in times like like we saw earlier in the year and, and and ongoing for that community to challenge the symbolic nature of of having a, a reconciliation action plan which is great but to focus on the tangible and real actions that corporates and even individuals can take to actually step up um, to to support these communities um, so yeah I I, I I was really, um, I was really pleased uh, you did what you did in, in in that context and and in your own way helped to direct some really much needed uh, financial support to that community at the time where often um, you know that's that's most of what's needed is that financial support and then those on the ground that are closer to communities can then direct where that money is best spent. So uh, I think that was great. So thank you for for taking you know, your own leadership on those issues. Um, speaking of leadership and something that we've spoken uh, about uh, since the floods as well, that's something that really stood out to you was um, the leadership of uh, First, Nation, First Nations women in, in the Northern Rivers community in response to the, the flood crisis. 
can you just talk a little bit about um, you know what what you saw and what you continue to see in the context of First Nations leadership down there? Uh, what what I saw was just truly inspiring. It was a it, it it spoke to something which I think is quite unique, distinct, and and and, and probably quite innate among First Nations women is their ability to to lead in in times of crisis. Um, you know, I think what Naomi did at the Koori Mail, supported by so many other First Nations um, women that were organising, um, you know, sorting the hub, working with a whole range of different um, groups coming in, but to see that firsthand um, said to me that there, there is something quite um, unique about the role that First Nations women play when you're dealing with something so catastrophic, um, impactful, like the floods. And 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 that 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 story should not be um, underestimated because I think it I think it also talks to where a lot of the I guess focus needs to be going forward, particularly when we we think about the the, the you know the future imminent threat of floods. Um, that are going to impact the Northern Rivers region and what role does community play, but particularly those First Nations women play as, as part of that. Um, you know, the, the, the countless hours, um, the heavy lifting, the, you know, the sorting of donated goods as they're coming into the crew mail hub, the, um, the logistics, the, you know, dealing with some real idiots that would come in from time to time and how they handled that conflict with just a level of measure and um, um, calmness that you know us blokes would probably struggle to do. Uh, what 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 they what they did and what I observed and how they continued that for well over six months, like that that that's a that, that's a that's a beautiful story that needs to be told. And I know that there's been um, you know accolades for the Cory Mail. I know that the Cory Mail have raised a lot of money. I know that. There's other organisations that played a really great role, particularly led by other First Nations women. I, I just think it would be a real shame not to capture that story, and it'd be a real shame um, for those First Nations women that put in so much to not have their their story told and 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 to be celebrated because that that in itself was a was such a beautiful um, highlight to come out of such devastation was the, you know, and we're not just talking about young First Nations women, we're talking about elders, we're talking about those who had lost their own property, those who are going through their own, um, you know, grief and trauma and tragedy, um, those who, you know, sacrifice so much of their own time um, to provide for others. And th these were First Nations women, not only providing for our communities, but it was also for the broader community um, up there. And, and, and I just think, you know, when you think about everything our people have been through and what we've endured over the last 200 plus years to have First Nations women who step up and still provide and still support the broader community and still do it in a way that um, that displays this extraordinary um, leadership, calmness, resolve, commitment and determination. Yeah, I, I just applaud those women. I, I really, I, I really think we particularly <laughs> First Nations men have a lot to learn from them. Thank you. And I think uh, from my own perspective, because I was able to visit the hub, I think it's it's one thing to talk about the hub, um, but to visualise it and see the the scale of what was in what those predominantly women, as you've said, were running uh, and ran for, for six months and aspects are still ongoing. That's absolutely phenomenal. And as as you say, you know, it, it started off as a tent. Um, but in the end, you know, they're, they're, you know, meals being made for, you know, I don't know how many people, but a, a considerable period of time. There's the op shop. There was, I think, the Koori Coles, as it was um, named, which was the which was where I visited, um, which was you know any 
any supplies that you could, you know, possibly need to get you through that time. And as you said, not just available to the First Nations community there, but anyone impacted by the floods in, in as well. And then the op shop as well, with all the clothes and, and other goods that were donated. And, and plus um, a mental health support as well, uh, and other aspects of support. So the scale was just incredible and um, and from nothing, basically. So I, I agree with you, Joe. I mean, that, that leadership, um, and um, the the way the community and and the First Nations leaders, female leaders in that in that space, were able to mobilise and maintain that support for such a long period of time is absolutely incredible and is is very worthy of celebration. And we're very excited to be speaking with Naomi. Yeah, it, it's it's worth celebrating for all all of what you mentioned, Leanne. I think it's also worth celebrating for the fact that. I don't think any of them would have ever done this before. And I don't think oh, exactly. any of them would have known what they were doing. I think none of them would have you know, felt that they were equipped or trained or prepared. So the fact that they emerged so quickly, um, but worked it out even quicker yep. and were able to maintain it, as you say, for, um, for not only the length of time they did, but the scale of the operation. Um, you know, I, I was there when the Prime Minister turned up. I was there when the Governor General turned up and and they were just blown away. They were blown away by the sheer scale operation, the leadership involved and and to not only to not only celebrate First Nations women leading that, but to also think about how quick they were able to adapt and innovate so quickly um, that 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 that's that's truly remarkable. No, oh, I agree. Um, looking forward now, uh, and I've just seen on the news that parts of uh, central New South Wales are being impacted by floods. We're doing this interview in September, um, and um, and we're looking at you know uh, potentially a, a, another. La Nina, another, you know, very wet summer for many communities along the eastern coast. What what do you see are uh, the immediate challenges and opportunities um, and uh, around preparedness and, and response as we face this, um, you know, this summer coming for, uh, towards us? I think the challenges are immense, Leanne. I think one big challenge, particularly for the Northern Rivers region, is what have we learned from the last floods? What do we know has worked well and wasn't had worked well? And what would we do different? And I don't know, I don't know if we're having enough of that conversation at the moment, because at the same time, there are other priority issues, You're still trying to find places for those who have been displaced to have a roof over their head. Uh, for those who are still struggling to come to terms with the extraordinary trauma they've gone through. And to to think that in the space of a few more months, we could be seeing further floods, I, I, I do worry. I, I worry whether we're coming to terms with the, um, just with the, 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 the imminent threat that's on our doorstep. As you mentioned last week, the Bureau of Meteorology confirmed that we're we're in our third La Nina weather pattern event. We're already seeing, as you say, out in central West New South Wales, the impact that that's having. We already know that for a lot of those communities in the Northern Rivers region, even in central West New South Wales, those areas are fully saturated. So even with the, the smallest amount of rain coming in, there's nowhere for that water to go and it rises very quickly and we have flash flooding. So. There, there is a lot of work that needs to happen at the community level to make sure communities properly prepared, that they're resourced so they can own their own um, preparation, response and recovery to those floods. Uh, we heard um, today about the, you know, the, the changes that the government have made, particularly at the federal level, um, you know, creating a new agency that hopefully provides better coordination between federal government and state government. Um, and, and there's obviously a lot of work that needs to happen around, you know, the long-term 
adaptation and resilience um, efforts that need to go into this because I think I think we've just got to come to terms with the fact that what we're seeing play out is not unprecedented anymore. This is this is unfortunately what we're having to now face as a nation. Uh, it, it's something which we're going to have to address at a community level in terms of getting them better prepared so that they can deal with and lead uh, their own responses to floods. At the same time, we need to see better coordination from government in investment in thinking about how to get behind those community efforts, but also around the long term implications. But I think there's, you know, I, I said this to a number of my colleagues at, at the time of when the floods occurred is that, you know, we, we can look at this from two perspectives, particularly for the Northern Rivers region and say, well, that's just the way it's going to be. And we're just going to have to deal with it or relocate the community or, you know, whatever type of, um, you know, solution that um, addresses those immediate problems. Or you've got another you've got another opportunity to look at. This is probably the worst natural disaster to hit the Northern Rivers region. We know the impact it's had on property, on livelihood. Well, why don't we why don't we turn our mind to thinking about how can you turn that whole area into the most sustainably designed and built communities going forward? Mm. So that when we think about the future of our communities and we think about what we want those to look like, um, why can't they be the most sustainably designed and built communities in Australia and become an exemplar for other communities that are going to have to grapple with the same challenges? And that requires, it requires innovation, it requires significant investment, not just from government, but the private sector. But it's a challenge we should all be up for because if we can get that right, it means that as a nation, how we deal with this going forward, we're in a far more better position to, um, you know, drive better adaptation, resilience, and further mitigate the risk of what we saw happen up in Lismore and surrounding communities. Yeah, and I think, um, look, I agree with all that, Joe, and I think as well, um, you know, this is, we're, we're talking about floods, this is a, a water stories seminar, but, you know, Obviously, that Northern Rivers community, the communities around the, the Clarence River and, and, you know, a lot of communities on the East Coast and, and West Coast of Australia were impacted by the Black Summer bushfires as well and, and also impacted by drought. And so in the, in the broader context of environmental disasters, you know, it would be great to move to a space where we can see flooding as an asset. Um, and and to help us combat future environmental disasters that are drought and are fire, and we can use the communities that are impacted by floods in a really positive way, as opposed to you know responding to crisis as a result of flood. Um, I think it, you know that that's a that's a really useful conversation as well. In looking forward, and and I think the um, just just to quickly pick up on that, Leanne. There is a there is a challenge with that, and I and I don't want to diminish. You know, when when I talk about the you know, let, let's be quite optimistic about having conversations around what the future could look like and things that we can be doing now and things we can be putting in place. Um, but I don't want to I don't want to diminish the, the the circumstance a lot of these communities in the Northern Rivers region still face, mm -hmm. because as I mentioned. It, it's easy for me to talk about, you know, what a sustainable, sustainably built community could look like, when on the other hand, you've got families who, for the last six months, haven't had a place to be able to, um, you know, live, and 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 I'm acutely aware of that. So I think there's and and there's also a, a, another challenge around, you know, it, it's it's easy to talk about you know, how we sustainably build communities or how we relocate communities, but there's also a cultural attachment and history and connection many communities have to place. Um, so just, just being mindful of the of the, the sensitivities and some of the, I guess, circumstances a lot of families, a lot of communities still face going forward. I think that the, the challenge is how we bring those conversations together. Yeah. Without, without trying to get too far ahead of ourselves, 
when so many of those people in those communities are still left behind and, and how do we bring them up to speed from housing, from mental health support to creating a sense of stability so that they're in a better um, a better state of mind to have this conversation around what the future looks like. Yeah, move, moving beyond what they're still in, which is which is crisis. Yeah. Um, Joe, that's probably a, a good point to to hand back over to you for any any final key messages you wanted to share with our audience. And, and re really appreciate the the opportunity you've given me, Leanne. I think. You know, my, my story is only one of many stories. Um, I, I was quite privileged to be able to do what I was able to do and have the support of Deloitte to be able to do that. And, and my contribution is is in no way, um, you know, anywhere near the contribution that those who are living in these communities um, experience and what they had to do day in, day out and wake up and see those waters at their doorstep. And, and I just want to applaud them for their leadership and, and also just their immense bravery um, to do all that work and um, you know, and I take my hat off to them. I think the, the call out I'd have to those you know watching this um, you know this conversation is there's a lot that you can still be doing now to help prepare those communities for what's to come. So when we think about the Northern Rivers region of New South Wales, when we think about Central West New South Wales, when we think about South East Queensland, um, th there's a lot there's a lot that we can be doing now, particularly when we think of a lot of the challenges that those individuals and families had to go through just to you know get access to flood recovery, uh, support to be able to put claims on insurance, to dealing with a whole range of different service providers just to be able to get food and um, shelter and other support for their families. What we can be doing a lot now to actually make that, process easier, whether it's sitting down, you know, as a as a community legal centre or for your pro bono efforts to support those communities and those individuals, you know, get digital copies of all their key documents so they don't have to wait till the floods and find out that they don't have the documents to be able to be eligible for government support. It's making sure that insurance if they've got insurance is up to date and making sure that we can get digital copies of all that information um, and, and, and doing a lot of that prep work now and, and looking at where we can, you know, maybe get behind the Corey Mail and, and, and start to donate money as part of not the recovery effort, but starting mm -hmm. to stockpile all, all the right um, things that we know we needed as part of the recovery, but we can be doing that now. We can be helping those communities have the money to be able to access those things in advance. So my, my, what my challenge to those on the call is don't wait for the floods because yeah. once you wait for the floods, it's too late and, 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 it's, and it's chaos. But if we, can, if we can start to engage with those community leaders now, the Koori Mail is a great organisation to deal with. You're going to have Naomi that you'll hear from. Let, let's find ways to get, get ahead of the, the floods, support community now, and think about what might be some of those very simple but very impactful practical efforts um, that we can um, support community with. But aside from that, Leanne, my, my, my real my, my real call out here is to is to seriously acknowledge the role that First Nations women play and who will continue to play. Um, that needs to be celebrated. Uh, I think just recognizing the um, the impact floods have not only on us physically, but also what it means for our connection to country. And when we see our waterways that are the lifeblood of our communities and our culture and our way of life being seriously um, impacted, that has a that that has an impact on us uh, in in many ways. But the great thing about First Nations people, the great thing about Aboriginal people from all parts of the country, but particularly up in the Northern Rivers region, is that we are incredibly innovative. And we want to be part of that solution going forward. So, you know, look to us for those solutions. Talk to us about what those solutions could look like for community, and let's be part of that journey of you know shaping a different type of future uh, for both those communities, but also the nation as a whole. Excellent, excellent um, opportunities for us all to engage with them, Joe. Um, 
Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been so lovely to talk to you again. Um, I and and for sharing, you know, your your water story as it is for for National Water Week. Um, I encourage uh, any of anyone who's dialed in and, and is listening to this series to connect with Joe. You'll probably get bombarded, Joe. So apologies for that. But you know, to really because you do you do challenge people, um, uh, particularly in the corporate sphere, to to think and do things differently, which is uh, in the face of this crisis, but in, in the context of you know First Nations issues more generally. Um, so again, thank you on behalf of um, Hopgood Gannon Lawyers and uh, Caxton Legal Centre. Thank you for joining us and um, encourage anyone listening to, to uh, engage with our other interviews as part of this um, Justice in Focus Water Story series for 2022. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Leanne.